Hi there, and welcome to week nine of Finance, Financial Markets and Institutions. And this, in this week, we're going to cover the money markets. So far in this module, as you know, we've covered the regulations, we went through the insurance sector, and then last week we covered the banking industry. And in the banking industry lecture, we talked about the intermediary process in the context of a capitalist society. And we also discussed what the financial system looks like. We, look, we talked about direct lending between suppliers and borrowers. We went through the intermediary process through the banks. But you remember the second route in the diagram was via the markets. And this is where we'll start talking about the markets today in the concept of the money markets and the short term borrowing that ranges from overnight up to one year. And this can be between the ultimate borrowers and the ultimate suppliers, but this could also be between the financial markets and the intermediaries from that diagram last week. So in this lecture, we're going to cover a brief introduction of what the money markets is, the main characteristics of the instruments that are traded on this market. We will then discuss the operations of the central banks in relation to quantitative easing using the, these markets. And then in part two, we'll go through the various calculations of how we work out the returns and yields on the money market products, starting with the discounted products, then the coupon bearing products, and finishing off with the calculations of the returns on, on the repurchase agreement products. So firstly, ask yourself, it's the end of the month, you don't have very much in your bank account, you've only got a bit of change in your pocket, you can't have access to funds from the bank of mum and dad, but you have a friend's birthday to go to tonight. What can you do to potentially get the funds to attend this celebratory dinner? Or do you go to your pal and say, sorry, I can't go? Pause the video and have a think of the various options you may choose to try and get access to funds in order to celebrate your friend's birthday. Some of these items of potential examples that you may do from a retail consumer point of view. You could potentially go into your overdraft, whether you've got an authorised one from your bank or an unauthorised one. You may potentially stick it on a short term uh, credit card. You may potentially also go to like a payday loan, or you may ask your friends through the informal financial system. I should mention at this stage, I would not condone any of these methods. I feel you should be honest with your friend that you couldn't potentially afford their birthday. I'm very sure your friend would be understanding and would support you in this. And I wouldn't uh, recommend anybody getting into debt uh, unnecessarily. However, this example I've just shown you is kind of from the retail market, the small loans between individuals, but then loans were potentially short term. Credit cards are short term or meant to be short term, paid in loans especially are short term, high cost, but these are very retail market quick short fixes. How do we scale that up? How does the likes of governments, banks and companies do a similar sort of borrowing if they're in a sort of predicament where they need access to short-term funds overnight. Well, it's the wholesale money markets that these institutions use. The word wholesale means on a large scale. So the transactions are not a couple of quid, they're couples of millions of quid, okay? Um, they're short-term, which means either overnight to one year, and if we look at the flip side, if you're in a position where you have extra, you have extra surplus, then what do you do with it? Do you just sit it in cash? That's potentially not going to earn any interest. If you have an additional surplus for a short period, then you can also use the money markets as the supplier of funds. So you potentially issue or invest in these products. So whether you are the supplier of funds or the demand of funds, then that's why you use this short-term wholesale market to allocate resources efficiently. 
So if you remember last week when we talked about these markets, they're not the concept of just literally passing money between each other. It's the buying and selling of certain financial instruments. And in this context, it is the money market instruments that we'll cover shortly. And they're traded on the secondary market, so they're already an issue. And the ultimate borrowers and ultimate suppliers essentially buy and sell these instruments between each other. They tend to be extremely liquid, so they, on balance sheets, they tend to be cash or cash equivalents in the form of accounting. Also, they tend to be known as lower risk. And the people that deal in the money markets are what's known as guilt edged. Therefore, they've got certain risk characteristics or they've got a very high credit rating in the first place. Therefore, the likelihood of default is much lower within these markets. Because they're overnight or short term, you're less likely to default over a short period. And the people that are working in these markets tend to be larger institutions with higher credit ratings. And as I mentioned repeatedly, the term is short term. Due to US law, the likes of commercial papers can only be no longer than 270 days. Otherwise, they have to be issued as a bond, which is a longer term product that we'll cover next week. So typically, overnight up to one year is the duration of any money market instrument. Where are these markets? Well, they could be domestic within the country or they could be international. So the domestic money market is where ultimate suppliers and ultimate borrowers would buy and sell these money market instruments within that country. And then for it's governed by that country's laws. However, there is a concept known as the euro money markets. Now, this market really originated following the wartime where the euro currency did not exist. So whenever you see the term euro money market, this doesn't mean the transactions in the euro currency. OK, this is potentially holding a currency outside of the jurisdiction where that country is issued. So the biggest euro money market is the euro dollar market. A euro dollar is the likes of a US dollar deposit or instrument that's held at a foreign bank. So I do say a bank in London was holding an instrument in US dollars. That would be known as a euro dollar. And because it's a dollar product, but it's held outside of the United States, it's not actually subject to regulation from the US authorities. So the euro money markets is a way of potentially raising your own currency outside of your own country, and it is subject to less regulation. And typically, it's known as bearing holding. Therefore, you hold it, you own it. You don't need to record that you own it. So there is an element of anonymity there as well. Therefore, if you are asked to compare these two markets, then you would note the domestic one is your domestic currency, buying and selling of product in your domestic currency within that country of origin. But the euro money markets is the transactions of your currency donated product, but outside of your country of residence. And therefore, the euro market has a, a bit less regulation and isn't governed by that country's regulator because it's not within that country's jurisdiction. So if you had to compare the two, that's how you do it. But just to remind everyone, it has absolutely nothing to do with the euro currency. For instance, you could have a euro euro, which would be a product that is donated in the euro's currency that's held, I don't know, in South America, because not in Europe. If we want to briefly look at the structure of the money market itself, then hopefully you might be able to see this from the concept of last week's diagram where we had lenders and borrowers on the sides and then we had the market in the middle. But obviously within that circle market in the middle, this is what it actually potentially looks like. 
you have what's known as the market makers and the intermediaries. Now, technically, as mentioned last week, the market maker and the intermediaries could be the same person here. So the market makers or the intermediaries, they are the go-between the lenders and the borrowers. So potentially lenders and borrowers would buy and sell these money market instruments via the intermediaries or market makers. And then it's the role of the central clearing house where all the instruments are kept and held. It's their role to ensure that the paperwork is there to know who is the owner of said product that's just been traded. So you could potentially even simplify this diagram by having borrower, then just having money market intermediary as one box, clearing house in the middle, and again, intermediary money market in one box, then the lender. But don't forget there is the concept of a central clearing house. And this is the place where the instruments are kept, they're held, they store electronically the ownership of said products if the ownership is captured. So why would you use the money markets? Certainly if you were a saver, then the purpose would be to return some sort of interest. So you potentially issue a product or you buy and sell a product to receive a return. In other words, your cash sitting there actually works for you and doesn't just get eroded. And this is the concept of the time value of money. This is due to inflation. Essentially, £100 today buys you more than what £100 in a year's time will buy you if, interest, if inflation is on the rise. And as you know, the most central bank's target is being 2% inflation. So if someone was to offer you £100 today, or if you want to receive £100 in a year's time, it's best to take it today because it's worth more due to the time value of money. Therefore, if you're sitting with a surplus, and a large surplus because it's wholesale, the money markets, then potentially you might want to do something and lend it out or sell a, sell a product on the money markets to return some sort of interest or yield. And this interest kind of compensates you for deferred consumption because if you give a lump sum now, then that means you're not spending it. You're not actually using it uh, for your own personal use or create your own wealth. I guess you are just deferring your consumption. You're not spending it. Also, you will want to do this to, like I said, avoid inflation. Because if you can, if you use your cash and you potentially return an interest on this, then it combats the fact that your money is just getting eroded due to inflation. And because it's not sitting in a pile of cash and you're actually trading it, then obviously when it comes to interest, you do want to be compensated for that potential risk of not actually getting that money back in the form of default and other various risks we referred to last week. And the last bit of terminology here in the money markets is when we talk about interest rates, we don't say 1%. We say 100 basis point or BIPs. Because these are wholesale money markets over short periods of time, the interest rates or the yields are very minimal. But they're very minimal on large sums, which nominal is still a lot. You probably think it's still quite a sizable amount. So we always refer to return on interest in the money markets as basis, basis point or BIPs. So just remember, 1% is 100 basis point. And if we have a look at the concept of the time value of money, where we work out potentially what the risk-free rate would be in an economy, let's assume that the cost of deferring your consumption for a year is 3%. In other words, if you don't want to spend £100 a day, then you want to defer it for a year's time, you need to be compensated £3 for that because of the time value of money. As mentioned before, the fact that £100 today buys you more than what it will in a year's time. So let's assume 
that the government's target rate is 2.5% at the moment, then under these assumptions, we can find out the risk-free rate of return that we want to require. And when we mean risk-free, we mean risk-free of risk -free of default. So if we do the math, say, obviously you've got 1 plus 3%, which is the deferred consumption, times 1 plus 2.5%, which is the inflation target, then minus 1 off that, you will return a risk-free rate of 5.58%. Now, what is this risk-free rate? As the name suggests, it's risk-free return taking into account zero risk. And as I just know, this really refers to the likes of default risk. And within the money markets, as I mentioned, the operators within the money markets tend to have very high credit ratings. And because it's short term overnight, up to a year, the likelihood of default is much lower. And from an investor point of view, when we have the risk free rate, then when we buy and sell any sort of product or look to invest, ultimately what we want to return is the risk free rate plus any risk premium for the characteristics of that investment or that sort of deposit. So that's when we look for the nominal rate of interest or our required rate of return. And later on, we might do the capital asset pricing model, for instance, which would potentially work out our required rate of return. Ultimately, what we're looking for is this 5.58%, given them assumptions, plus some additional compensation for the risk we're taking depending on that product. The idea being if it's a more risky product like equities, our risk premium, our rate of return that we require would be much higher. But then in practice, in practicalities, the real rate of interest, the rate we actually get back is the required rate of return of whatever product we invested in minus inflation. Personally, people don't obviously take into account inflation rate. They just see there, oh, I made this X percent on this investment. They never minus off the fact that inflation may have increased over that year. And that's obviously from a personal point of view. But ultimately, if you're going to do the maths properly, the real rate of interest is whatever the product yields from your nominal rate of interest minus the inflation over the duration of however long that investment was. But obviously the inflation rate, if it's the money markets, would be quite low given that money markets are short term and inflation overnight is nowhere near as high as inflation over a year. So now let's just have a think of who potentially uses these markets and why they would do so. Well, as noted, they tend to be the organisations with higher credit ratings and they're wholesale. So it's going to be institutions that have large sums of surplus or potentially require large funds of borrowing over a short period. So, for instance, you have the large organisations, companies, they may use the money markets to have available credit lines, potentially pay suppliers or to provide or to access liquidity. Pension funds. Pension funds tend to invest in equities longer term. Therefore, when they need to pay potential pension payments to its retired customers, then they may potentially use the money markets to gain liquidity, to, to gain cash in order to facilitate the cash flow to its customers. Banks can certainly use the money markets to generate wealth, whether they're borrowing to lend out, or if they are issuing certificate of deposits, which are basically large savings accounts over a short period. And this would allow companies to deposit money with them. Therefore, their capital looks a lot higher because they have a large deposit over a short term in the institution. And lastly, the central banks, which will come on to in the end of this part, use the money markets to help generate the wealth creation. And potentially this is where the QE quantum easing comes into play, where they potentially 
print additional surplus to buy back bonds from the institutions, but also potentially increase liquidity within the money markets and potentially buy back the likes of treasury bills, which are money market instruments, which we'll cover now. So in the money markets, there are five different products that can be issued and then bought and sold on the secondary market. The first one is the treasury bill. Because of the name treasury, then this gives the clue that it's issued by uh, the government of countries. And this is short term borrowing from the government. So the government would issue a treasury bill or T bill where the investor would buy it. And then the end of the product, the government would pay the base value of the T bill. So the way it works is simplified. They would issue something that has a value of £100. The investor would buy it for £95. And then at the end of the product, the government would give back the £100 to the investor. So the investor would make £5. The commercial paper is the same kind of product, but issued by a company. Obviously, this has a certain level of credit risk attached, unlike a treasury bill. And next, we have the interbank deposits, which are also known as banker's acceptance, depending on which textbook you have a look at. And this is a mechanism which helps to facilitate international trade between companies. This is where potentially companies will need to borrow short term or have a letter of credit issued in their name from their bank when making a transaction potentially with a foreign counterpart in another country. So potentially a company in the UK might order a large sum of goods from Asia, from a supplier in Asia, and because the Asian company might not know who this company is, ultimately the banks of these companies talk to one another. Potentially the UK company would issue a letter of credit saying that they have the company has the money to pay. If not, the bank will pay this sum to the Asian bank to compensate them in the case of default or the customer couldn't pay for the order. And this issuing a letter of credit is kind of a deposit between the UK bank and the Asian bank. And this is kind of this deposit can then be traded if the company in the UK potentially needs the cash quicker. So this agreement of letter of credit between one bank to another bank can be sold in the secondary market. Or alternatively, they could wait for this, for the goods to arrive in the UK, and then potentially the payment could just be sent. But if, like so the Asian company needed the money quicker, then they have this letter of credit sitting there. They can potentially sell that letter of credit to somebody else to get the cash immediately. The next item is the certificate of deposit, and this is the one I mentioned before, where if a company or government has a large sum of cash, then they can place that into the bank. And this is like a very large savings account when essentially you put like a large sum of money in, then the, the certificate of deposit will end in a month's time, we'll say, and then the bank will give you that cash back plus a little bit of interest. And this is good as a, as, a, as a surplus because you receive an interest payment on just holding cash there. But for the bank, as I mentioned before, it makes their balance sheet look a lot healthier if they've got a large sum of cash sitting there. And then the last one is the repurchase agreement. And this is quite similar to like a pawn shop in the UK where you potentially sell something to someone and then buy it back at a later date, paying a little bit more. So in the financial markets, this tends to be the likes of treasury bills. And this is where the lender of last resort example came in from last week. So a bank may go to the central bank and say, can you buy these T-bills off me? The central bank will buy the T-bills. And then potentially overnight or a week later, the bank will buy them back from the central bank and pay a little bit extra. Obviously, the return for the central bank is the difference between the buying and selling price. 
For more information and a better description of these products, please view the summary lecture that I posted from Principles and Theories of Finance, but also do some reading on these five different products. Now let's recap the central bank and the open market operations that we referred to at the end of last week's lecture, but in the context of the money markets. So as we noted, the central banks, you know, their main aim is to maintain stable inflation, to ensure that the economies are ticking over nicely, not too fast, not too slow, to obviously help the wealth creation within an economy. And the best place to manipulate short-term funding or the availability of liquidity within the market is certainly by using the money market. And if we also remember, the role of the central bank also is to kind of potentially intervene in the currency markets as the printer of the domestic currency in that country. So not only will it potentially increase or contract the supply of liquidity and potential money market uh, instruments and cash, it can also intervene in the currency markets and potentially the euro dollar or the euro market due to the influence it has on the price setting of the currency in that country. But the main role of the central bank really comes to price setting rather than the kind of deposit side. And this is where the central banks obviously try to control inflation by monetary policy and price setting of the interest rates. And if the central banks lower the interest rate in that country, then that does have an immediate reaction in the money markets and the currency markets. Thus, the domestic money market, obviously, their rates would drop as well. However, in the domestic currency markets, the value of the currency would also drop, which means the euro market may be a bit more buoyant. So reducing interest rates will certainly help lower the interest rates in the money markets, but it would also potentially have a short-term lowering of the currency value. And this is where people may start raising their currency overseas to yield a better return from the euro money markets rather than domestic money markets. And this is kind of summed up here, all else being equal. And if we remember the fact that anybody certainly from the borrowing side of the equation, they're only going to borrow if it's going to yield them profit or make their business more efficient. Therefore, they will take advantage of lower interest rates because it makes profitable investments more likely when your borrowing is a lot lower. And if we can see this from a graphical point of view, on the left-hand side, we have the concept of quantity of reserves, in other words, the amount of cash in the economy. And in theory, this is a straight line when it comes to supply. But on the right hand side, this is the supply of loans, which is not a straight line because the supply of loans can change depending on how much cash individual institutions have. Have. So as you can see, using the numbers, if we look to the left-hand side, if the central bank lowers the price or the interest rate in that country, then that would lower the or that would lower the price, with the desired effect that the supply of loans would increase. So looking over to the right, you can see number two there. If interest rates drop or they're lowered then the supply of loans shifts because there's more cash available. And as you can see, if the supply of loans increases, with more loans being available, that will bring down the interest rates on the loans, which ultimately shifts demand for loans because loans become cheaper. And if there's more demand for loans, then that generates wealth and because there's more wealth creation, that ultimately results in number five, the amount of cash in the economy shifting. 
So hopefully from this diagram, if you take time to pause the video and work out what's gone on, policy rates are being lowered, which shifts the supply of loans. And if there's more loans, then interest rates on the loans drop. And interest rates on loans dropping increases demand for the loans. These loans are designed to generate wealth. And if wealth is generated, then the central bank needs to make the supply of reserves or the supply of cash to be increased because of the additional wealth in the economy. And you can imagine on the flip side, if the economy is progressing well and the likes of inflation is starting to take over, then we need to start curbing in inflation. How do we do that? That will be to increase policy rates so that loans would become more expensive, therefore people wouldn't potentially take out loans and this may also have an impact on the currency and the money markets being less liquid the opposite and if you look at the diagram again from the one two three four to five it is the opposite effect when you increase interest rates or the central bank increases interest rates it really lowers the demand for loans Therefore, the amount of cash needed in the economy will also shrink. So just to recap there, whenever the central bank changes interest rates, then it will impact the money markets due to the supply of cash available due to the demand for loans. But also it will, it will impact the domestic currency of the products and potentially influence whether you use the domestic money market or the euro market. And lastly, just to correct what you can see on the slide there, at the time of this recording, the UK base rate is actually 10 basis point, which is 0.1%, not 0.75% or 75 basis point. This was produced before the coronavirus pandemic which obviously resulted in the central banks lowering interest rates globally to try and kickstart the loan demand and generate additional wealth to try and kickstart the economies around the world. And this concludes part one of the lecture. Hi there, and welcome to the second part of this lecture on the money markets. And in this part, we're going to discuss the mathematics behind working out the various returns on the products from the money markets. Therefore, before watching this video, I hope that you have a good understanding of how these products operate in practice and what the concept is if they're issued at a discount or if they're issued where interest is paid on maturity or in the case of repurchase, the characteristics of the payment working between the difference between the buying and the selling price. So I hope you have watched the previous lecture on this topic and also the summary lecture from Principles and Theories of Finance to ensure you fully understand how these products work before we actually discuss calculating the returns on these products. But also this element of the lecture is not about the pricing. It's not about the pricing of the money markets. The examples are going to be very much that the price has already been determined. We know what the interest rate on them if they're issued with an interest rate. So also do understand the concept of LIBOR and that the fact that the LIBOR rate is what's usually used to determine most money market products and their prices on short-term borrowings and lendings. So also review the concept of LIBOR and the alternatives to LIBOR as LIBOR will be phased out from next year. Therefore, this mathematics in this lecture is really based on examples where we know what the price is and we're just working out the interest rate or the yield of these products. Now the nature of these slides is that they're rather readable. Therefore, I'm going to walk you through the slides, but 
ultimately for yourself to understand the mathematics, you'll have to read through the yourself at your own pace. And we'll also do examples within the seminar of the pricing. And additionally, there is an Excel spreadsheet available on Blackboard, which gives you a quick idea of how you potentially work out the returns for each. So first of all, we're going to look at the likes of the discounted products and when they're at issue. So work out the potential return we'll get at issue of discounted products. So this is potentially the T-bills and commercial payments. So let's say if a company wants to borrow 240,000, they would actually need to issue securities with a par value greater than this sum. Because remember, if they're issued at discount, you'd need to issue products or a face value of say quarter of a million. Because the products are issued at discount, the cash you receive would not be the quarter million which was written on the and our T-bills or commercial papers, you would receive a bit less. So, likes of this example here. And what we need to work out at the time of issue is the potential return from whatever the discount is to the par value and the difference between them two over the short period. Before we go on, just a bit of terminology that define the money markets. We have the concept of number of trading days. Because the money market is short term overnight, then depending on the number of days we use in a year can be quite significant when it comes to working out the basis point return. And in the money market conventions, the likes of the UK and Japan, when we talk about number of days in the year, we talk about three, six, five. But in Europe and the US, they tend to use 360. Now this is quite important, certainly from an examination point of view, because an exam question might spe specify if you're working in Europe or if you're working in the US. And for that, you'd have to remember which number of days in the year they use when they calculate the money markets. And there is convention where you can switch between the rates. So if you work out a rate based on UK and Japan, then to convert that to what the rate might be if you used 360, in the case of the US and Europe, then you would use these formulas below to work out the rate conversion. And as you can see in the first example on the left there, we have the UK and Japan based to the US European based and because we're trying to work out the US European we're trying to work out the rate if it was calculated at 360 days to do that you'd times 365 would be times by 360 over 365 and that would convert the UK return to what the potential return would be if it was in the market in the US or Europe. So now let's look at a mathematical example of a T-bill, so zero credit risk, or the assumption of no default risk given the potential safety of the government borrowings. Now what you can see on the screen here is that the par value of this T-bill is half a million pound. But remember, because these are issued at a discount, the assumption here is what the cash that's received from the government would be 247,500. So if you think, what is the real rate of return here? Well, if you think in the concept of nominal, in other words, cash, the difference between them two numbers is two and a half thousand pounds. So the government issue three month T bills, they will receive £247,500 from the issuing of these quarter of a million pound worth of T-bills and then at the end of the three months the government pay back to the investors quarter of a million pound. Therefore the nominal cost to the government here is £2,500. 
But what does that equate to in percentage return to the investors? And for this, as noted, the difference between the purchase price and the par value is £2,500. If we use a simple calculation on the rate of return, where we divide the nominal return, so the 2,500, we divide that by the par value of a quarter of a million, and we times that by 100, then that is a 1% return. So you'd say the investor has a 1% return in this transaction. But remember, this return is over three months, or in the example, 91 days. Therefore, we have to convert that into the potential annual rate of return to see if this was potentially rolled over for the year. And in order to do this, we look at the rate of return, which we just calculated as 1%. We times that by the number of days in the year because this is the UK, we're using 365. We divide that by the days number of days of the product, which is state of three months in the question is 91 days, and we times that by 100. So potential that annual rate of return of this product is 4.01%. So just to recap what actually happened there, because this was issued at a discount, the lender, they received £2,500 based on an investment of 247,500. However, the borrower received 247,500, but they paid back a quarter of a million. Therefore, they paid 2,500 on a borrowing of 247,500. So that was using a discounted product. But what would happen if the lender just put in that sum of money, that investment, what happens if instead of using a discounted product, what would happen if this lender or investor just put in the 247500 into the bank, so as a, just as a deposit, and that potentially just yielded an interest? And this example would be in the case of a certificate of deposit. For this future valuation calculation, we work out the annual rate of return of the interest divided by the initial deposit, and we times that by, again, number of days in the year divided by days to maturity of the product. And this time, last time we worked out that £2,500 worked out as 1%. But in this example, well, actually, the interest being 2500 it's divided by the initial deposit, not the par value. So in this calculation, you have two and a half thousand pound divided by 247,500, which is a return of 1.01. .01. And then if we times that by the time period, then the rate of return is slightly higher at 4.05 rather than 4.01. Now, what was the difference here? Well, last time we divided the 2,500 divided by the par value of quarter of a million. That's what got the 1% because that was an issue at discount based on par value. This time we're looking at the return based on the initial investment, 247,500. Therefore, the percentage return is slightly greater. And if we summarize this here, then what you can see is the first example is where we lent this sum of money for 91 days and received 2,500. That had an annual return of 4.01, so that's when we lend in the discounted product. But this second example, we invested. We put the money somewhere, potentially in the case of a certificate of deposit.
And because we just invested, put it somewhere, and we worked the calculation based on the initial deposit, not the par value quarter of a million, therefore our rate return was slightly higher. I have discussed how this worked in practice, but if we look at it from a mathematical point of view, if we look at the formulas here, it's the denominator in the equations which changed. In the first example, we used the money market rate of return, the par value in the denominator. In the second, we used the deposit rate of return, and we used the purchase price as the denominator. So the key difference there was for the discounted product, we used par value, but for the product issued that returned an interest, then we used the purchase price, or you could say the initial deposit price. When we look at the terminologies regarding the money market rate of return or the bank deposit rate of return, depending on which textbook you read, they may give you different terminologies. And I would be mindful of this. Essentially, the money market rate of return is the discount rate, and potentially the deposit rate is known as interest yield. So when you issue something at a discount, the rate of return you're looking at is the return of the discount, the difference between what you paid and then what you received as the investor. When we look at the likes of interest yield, we're looking at how much potential return we get for putting that deposit and then receiving an interest on it later on. And as I mentioned earlier on, these examples were given with the purchase price known or the initial deposit known. However, if it is unknown and it has to be calculated, then what you can see here is we have the money market rate of return formula on the top. We have the rate of return deposit formula in the middle there. If we need to work out the purchase price or the initial deposit, then we can rearrange the second formula here in the middle to achieve the purchase price formula at the bottom there. So in your own time, if you're familiar with formula rearranging, do try and practice this and practice rearranging the interest yield formula to achieve the purchase price formula. OK, now we're going to move on and look at the post insurance part. So in that last example, we looked at the return from day zero up to three months. So working out the return from issue. But remember, these products are traded on the secondary market. So you may not be the investor from day one. You may potentially buy this T-bill one month in. So then how do you work out the rate of return from one month in to the end of the product if you had to hold it until the maturity date of the T-bill. So we're going to use the same example. We're going to move 31 days. So it was issued, but then on the secondary market, a month later, 31 days later, then this product was bought by somebody else. Now remember, the par value does not change. That is still what's written on the table. That's still a quarter of a million. We are assuming here that the price hasn't actually changed. So a month later, the assumption here is that at T1, a month later on, the price of buying the T-bill is still the same as the discount at the issue. So in the secondary market right now, if you had to buy this T-bill, you'd still potentially pay 247500 Again, if we do the nominal mathematics here, then the difference between the market price and the par value is still the same. It's still going to potentially return the investor £2,500. Again, if we convert that into rate of return, then that is going to obviously still be 1%. However, because the time to maturity now is less, because we bought it 31 days in 
to this 91 day product, the number of days to maturity is 60, two months in this case, therefore 1% over the two month period actually works out as a rate of return of 6.08%. And if you remember last time, the annualized rate of return in this case was only 4.01%. Therefore, as the time to maturity goes down, i.e. less day to maturity goes down, the discount rate increases. But this obviously assumes that the market price and the par value would stay the same. Obviously, in the last part, given what we talked about, time value of money, and the fact that potentially with inflation tuned away, it kind of counteracts this. In practice, what should happen is that the discount rate should reduce the closer you get to maturity. That is because this example assumed that the price of the T-bill did not change. In normal market operations, the price would potentially change. As you get closer to maturity, the discount or the purchase price would get very close to the actual par value. Because technically, before a T-bill expires, the price really should be very close to the par value. Therefore, therefore through the lifetime of the T-bill, the market price will should slowly start creeping. The discount rate or price should start slowly creeping up towards whatever the par value of the T-bill actually is. And literally before the T-bill expires, if anyone wants to buy it in the secondary market, the price is going to be very close to the T-bill par value. Having said that, that's with the assumption that market interest rates do not change. In this example, we can potentially make a few assumptions on why the likes of the price didn't actually change from the discounted issue price. This could be that the default risk potentially changed because if, if default risk increased, then potentially the discount rate that, to entice any buyer would have to be greater because the investor would take on more risk. They'd want a higher rate of return. Therefore, the price obviously would still be lower. Potentially inflation rate in the economy changed and potentially the level of interest in the economy could have changed and that would also impact the value or the price of the T-bill one month later. So let's say we compare that. So assuming that we're looking at a different product entirely now, i.e. we're not looking at this product that would return 6.08% percent annualized return. What happens if we look for an alternative product, same characteristics, however this one still has the equivalent money market return of 4.01. Then with our previous example, have we just found a bargain? Did we make incorrect assumptions? It could be either but if again if we look back at the maths of this example we look we did the real issue lies with the market price in the example staying exactly the same one month in and we have to think about the economic reasons why the market price would stay the same and as mentioned the market price should converge towards a quarter of a million through the lifetime of the t-bill but in this assumption it may have stayed the same because of interest rate change, inflation rate change, or the level of default risk potentially increased. Therefore, investors want to be compensated for taking on the extra, extra risk. But then we also need to think about the concept of arbitration. And this is where potentially investors spot price differences within markets. If you've got two equivalent products at very different prices, then the supply and demand of each product will change for them to converge to one another. And if we work through the maths of this, 
using the equivalent product with the return of 4.01%, if we use the purchase price formula that we deviated earlier from the rearranging of the rate of deposit formula, then if we use the discount rate of 4.01 in this equation, with the par value remaining the same, because that doesn't change, a quarter of a million, then working through the numbers, you can see that the price of our money market instrument in the secondary market should have actually moved up towards the par value. And instead of the assumption being the market price stayed the same at 247500 our market price should really be 248,352 pounds. And it would or should be this price with the assumption that nothing else changed. So the market rates didn't change, the credit risk didn't change. But I hope going back through this example, you will notice that the secondary price or the secondary market price of this T-bill a month later should have moved up closer towards the par value of the T-bill. And just for the proof of this, if we now do the calculation based on par value staying the same, but this new market price that we've just calculated at 248,352, if we use that, obviously the nominal rate is now not 2,500, the nominal return is 1,648. If we do the same discount rate of return formula using obviously the two months, then the annualized rate of return is now the same as that other equivalent product at 4.01% return. And this has now enabled us to establish three important rules regarding money markets that are obviously traded on the secondary market. When comparing different money market products, then we can work out whether the trade is in an absolute profit position or not. We can work out the interest yield that we should achieve at a certain date. And as I've noted, the, the market price should move towards the par value as the product continues during its length of its time of being issued. And this makes sense because in the original example, we assumed that the discount rate had not changed, the par value stayed the same, therefore the amount of interest payable in absolute terms has actually fallen to reflect that the time rate is shortened from the purchase to maturity. Now I'm going to say this is over to you. So watch that example back if needed, or go through the lecture slides if needed. And what I want you to now do is pause the video and then work out these uh, questions. So you have a UK Treasury bill that's issued uh, at a million pound being the par value for 180 days, six months, and it's issued at a discount of 30,000. Therefore, I need you to work out what the discount rate is, what the interest yield is, and then what would the market price of this be with 30 days to maturity, assuming that the discount rate you calculate in one has remained unchanged. So pause the video and try and work this out now. Okay, so the first step is to work out the discount rate. So we use the discount rate formula. So we're using the par value as the denominator here. So then hopefully using the formula and then putting the numbers here, you'll work out the discount rate of 6.083%. And if we just show the maths of that there, I hope this is what you calculated yourself following these steps. Now let's have a look at the interest yield formula. Again, this time we're using the purchase price as the denominator. Hopefully that will have a, you will have an interest yield of 
Again, if we go through the maths of that, I hope the mathematics you worked out resembled this. And then lastly, we need to work out the purchase price with 30 days to maturity. So going through the maths here, and I hope you returned the market price now at £995,000. And this would make sense given that it's 30 days to maturity on a million pound. So again, you can see the, the fact that the market price has converged towards 1 million being the par value. Now we're going to move on to look at the money market instruments that are known as coupon bearing or basically interest bearing. The likes of you put a deposit somewhere and it returns an interest rate. So later on, you get us a large amount of money in return if you're the likes of the saver. And this is a bit more of a straightforward calculation. So this predominantly relates to the likes of certificate of deposit, which I mentioned before is kind of like a big savings account over a short term. You put some money in, then at maturity, the bank would pay you back a higher rate. Typically, when you place this into a certificate of deposit, then this certificate of deposit is non-negotiable. This is what the bank offers. Then you potentially accept that, put your money into the bank at that rate that is on the certificate of deposit. However, on the secondary market, this certificate, because that deposit is in the bank and it must stay there till the end of the certificate of deposit, you may potentially, if you want to get your money back, you can potentially sell off this certificate of deposit to receive the money back and this is where it's potentially negotiable because you're selling it off your certificate of deposit to get your money back sooner. So these sort of products are usually quoted on a yield to maturity basis. In other words what interest are you going to get? And the formula for this is kind of like the percentage change formula which is then factored by the number of days left or the number of days less than one year given that it's short-term savings kind of product. So you would have the par value, the amount you put in, you times that by the annualized rate which is times or factored by the length of the likes of the certificate of deposit. And then to work out the yield on this is you work out the value of, I suppose, the cash that's returned, so the value at maturity, you minus that from the present value, the initial deposit, and again you factorise that by the length of the product. So the first two formulas here are basically future valuation, future value calculations. And the last formula there is if you're trying to work out what is today's value of the money that will be returned on maturity. So if you think I'm going to receive X amount of pounds in a month's time, what is that worth in today's money at the present value? So this is not a future value calculation, this is a present day value calculation. That's why it tends to be the denominator is the annual rate of return factored for the number of days. But if we just give you an example of this rather than looking at the formulas, quite a simple example here is if you assume you put £100,000 into a bank with a certificate of deposit for 30 days at 85, 86 basis point, then you can see very quickly the calculation there is you have the par value plus 100,000 times my 86 basis point, which is factorised by 30 days over 365, again in the UK. And that would say if you have 100k of deposit now, in 30 days time, you will return back £100,070.68. So now 
let's assume that this tier of deposit is now in the secondary market and it is now negotiable. So we're going to look at the value after 15 days. So for this, we need to use the present value calculation. I, what is the present value of this? Given that we know how much this will return at maturity now, how much is this worth 15 days in? So we use the value at maturity. So we've just calculated that at 100 £100,070.68. pence. We now divide that by 1 plus the interest. Again, factorised the fact that it's 15 days, now not 30 days. So technically, 15 days in, the present value would be £100,038.33. Or another way of looking at that, this is that from day zero to 15 days, the, the nominal cash return from the 100,000 has gone slightly up to by 35 pound and 33 pence. So therefore, if we want to work out potential yields to maturity, so if we work out what the return in percentage is from day zero to day 15, then we use the potential value of maturity that it would have been if we let it sit there. We minus off the present value, the 15 days, divide that again by present value, factorize that by 15 days worth of return. So therefore the yield to maturity for the 15 days is 0.8599%. And I would say at this stage, when it comes to money market percentage return, when we use basis point, if you want to have it in percentage, it's always best to have four decimal places rather than rounding up because they're such small returns. Now, lastly, we're going to look at the calculations of the return on repurchase agreements. And to remember, this is the concept of the difference between the sale price and the repurchase price. So you'll sell something, receive cash for that, then to buy it back, you'll pay out more to buy it back. And it's the, really the difference between the purchase and, and the seller price of whatever the product may be. And then we have to take into account the time between the selling and the buying. So the formulas are quite simple here. If we look at the interest, it's really the selling price times the interest, again, factorised for the number of days. But if you want to work out the kind of buyback price, given the interest, then you knew how much you sold it for, and you have to times the selling price by the interest, again, factorised for the number of days. So let's look at an example of a repurchase. We're going to look at an interest calculation here. So let's assume that UK bank lend a lot, PLC, needs to borrow 20 million for only 21 days. It agrees a repurchase agreement with lend a little, PLC, who sells 20 million of UK government bonds today and then repurchases them back in 21 days time on an annual interest rate of 0.65%. What is the amount of interest that Lenderlock PLC pays for this repurchase money market instrument? Well, as we know, the selling price is stated at 20 million. So we times that by the annual interest rate of 0.675%, factorized for the 21 days. Therefore, the interest in nominal is 7,700. 67 and 12 pence. In other words, lend a lot PLC who are borrowing the 20 million, they essentially borrow 20 million and they need to pay 7,768 12 pence of interest in 21 days' time to do so. Now let's assume later that year, lend a lot PLC requires cash over a short period again. So it's decided to borrow 15 million from 
lend a little PLC for 45 days using again a repurchase agreement backed by the UK government. Bonds on an interest rate this time at 0.767%. We can now work out how much lend a lot would have to pay to repurchase the securities of the bonds from lend a little PLC after the 45 day period. So we know the selling price and that's 15 million quid. We know the interest at 0.675%. We need to factorise that by the 45 days in the UK year and that will work out the buyback as 15 million 14,184 pound. In other words, to do this repurchase agreement, the fact that lend a lot sells something to lend a little, and in order to buy them bonds back from lend a little, they would need to pay an extra 14,184 pounds on top of the 15 million they received in cash. So that concludes the various mathematical equations that are used within the money markets. I do hope that you are able to follow the mathematics and understand some of the concepts of why prices do change and how potentially they converge towards the par value as the product goes on. I'd highly recommend that you practice these mathematical examples. Do come prepared to the seminar of trying the seminar activities and we will do a number of mathematical examples. But as part of your directed study, you need to recap, go through the money market products to understand how they operate in the first place, thus to work out or be able to understand the maths again behind it. We didn't really talk about pricing at all, except from returns. Therefore, you need to understand and do some research into what LIBOR is and what is potentially replacing it. And then again, just practice, practice, practice. Have a look at the Excel spreadsheet on Blackboard, which shows you these mathematical examples and potentially have a play around at changing the numbers and to see how potential yields to maturity or prices change. Thank you for watching.